So the abductions usually always happen at night. These people don't really get abducted during the day. Usually a UFO appears and then the abductee blacks out. Okay, they then become paralyzed. A beam comes down and they begin to levitate up into the ship. They can even be transported through like solid objects like walls. And then the aliens will sometimes appear out of thin air. Okay. The abductees are then experimented on with like these primitive surgical tools, which I find very odd if they have such advanced technology. But the entities, when they're captured, they usually tell the abductee that their intentions are really good. Abductees have even mentioned that they say that they created humans, that they are the creator of Earth. Some have even disguised themselves as Jesus. Celebrities, well-known figures, family members, and they do this to gain the trust of the abductee. And in this regard, if what they're saying is true, you have to ask yourself why. Why do they need to conduct themselves in this way? Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to to the show. Thank you for listening to me and Ollie and Dave rabbit on for half an hour on YouTube before coming over here. So uh, uh, without further ado, uh, Dave, Ollie, and our special guest, Chilla Queen, Avery Warner, thank you for coming on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me on. That was actually a pretty cool intro. I like what you uh, guys put together. Ollie there. likes the intros. Ollie's, uh, Ollie, Ollie's our intro lad. <laughs> Hello, it's really good. Sorry, it's my only talent. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. <clears throat> That's what you uh, contribute. <laughs> yeah, now, obviously, you've been doing like so much stuff lately, and you've been putting some really, really good episodes out. It was uh I've been listening to your show for a while now. So I first heard you on Isaac Wiseup's podcast when you went when you went with him. Uh and I've so I've kind of I was kind of listening to you ever since that, that episode. Um, and but it was the one you did with the like angels and demons one that yeah. really sort of sorry the aliens and demons one, one that really sort of like got my attention um, and I, I've having like the interview you just did I've, no the guy's name escapes me who's Chris uh, Bledsoe yeah has your opinion on that changed now after that Um, that's what I'm wrestling with right now because, um, before, like right before I, I actually heard Chris Bledsoe on the tinfoil hat podcast. Mm -hmm. And that was directly after I had completely done all the research and put this episode out on our aliens demons. And I've have like this, I have more of like a, a Christian foundation. Um, I wouldn't say I'm like a, a devout Christian, but, or, or go to church and, and super religious, but Mm -hmm. I have been raised in, well, I grew up in the Catholic church and then I became a very devout Christian for a long period of time. And so a lot of my beliefs kind of stem from what I learned in the church, you know? And so as I started doing my research and, and looking into all of that kind of stuff, I kind of came to this conclusion that you know, there is a creator. I mean, with all the science that's out there, it really does point to the fact that there is a creator. And if there is a creator, then that kind of starts to explain a lot of what the Bible is talking about. And if that's the case, then looking at a lot of these abductee situations and, you know, how people 
have so much fear around it and just some of the experiences that they've had and all that kind of stuff that didn't really that kind of explanation I never really saw in the Bible, if that makes sense, um, where these people would come and, you know, betray themselves as as Jesus or um, public figures or any of that kind of stuff to gain, um, you know, uh, like, you know, to to get the people to talk to them and stuff like that. So um, so that kind of led me on a path to think that these were malevolent things. You know, these are demons. Maybe they're summoning demons and then looking at how the occult oftentimes is tied to an abduction case. You know, a lot of people have either dabbled in the occult prior to having an abduction or having a paranormal experience. And then afterwards, they usually have this awakening and start you know, going down the path of more of like the new age spirituality and all that kind of stuff. So that all together kind of gave me this revelation that maybe these are bad. But then I heard Chris Bledsoe's story on the tinfoil hat podcast. And his story really stuck out to me because um, he initially had his experience praying to God, you know, and what he he I mean, these these orbs came down and he started having all of this experience with them. And his story was completely different than anything I had seen before, because with Chris, um, he not only experiences the phenomenon, but he can actually call the phenomenon to him. He can summon the phenomenon on demand, basically. And these things come to him almost nightly. And. Oh. People around him have had experiences just being around him. And it follows him in particular because you know how a lot of paranormal events are almost tied energetically to a certain location. And with him, he can basically go anywhere and have the experience. And so I read his book and I was trying to get some good information out of that. Um, trying to trying to see if he's like dealt in the occult and, you know, maybe like what his views on religion is and stuff like that. And he I mean, his story really surprised me because um, he was a devout uh, Pentecost. He was in the P Pentecostal religion and he was devout um, a Christian. His whole family was and he had no prior experience in the occult. Um and then when he began to have this experience, um, his views on religion itself started shifting and changing. And um, and so I figured I was like, you know what? He only lives three hours from me. So I'm going to take a chance and reach out to him because if he's able to summon this phenomenon on demand, I kind of want to see if I can go up there and experience the phenomenon and see for myself how I feel about it. And uh, I reached out to him. He said, you know, yes, you can come, you know, up and experience the phenomenon. It doesn't happen for everybody. I can't guarantee it because sometimes they don't show up for people who are skeptical. Um, but, you know, if you're open, usually it happens. So when I went up there and actually experienced the phenomenon myself, um, the, that has like opened up my my mind to now trying to understand it because I came from a point of thinking like this was malevolent, but now I'm like what I experienced was not at all. Um, it was more like I don't know if you guys have a question, but um. I was just going to say that, like, that's yeah. the um, the hitchhiker, isn't it? That that he's experienced. The is it the hitchhiker effect that they call it, where these things kind of latch onto you and they 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 essentially come home with you and they can just go wherever you go. But as I understand it, the hitchhiker effect happens just by being around him. Like you carry things with you from that experience. What did you experience? If we if you don't mind sharing, I don't, yeah, you know, I don't mind obviously. at all. Um, so when I went down there, um, 
me and Chris, we, I went down there. He said, come over around six o'clock. Um, eight o'clock is when we'll kind of go outside and do, we'll start some of the, the night watching when the sun goes down. And so I get there around six o'clock, me and my boyfriend are there and we start kind of talking. I just wanted to interview him, you know, off the record and get his story and have him answer some questions that I had referring to his book. And he, he just had such a like calming demeanor, just being around him just seemed like he was just, he was so sweet, so nice. And I didn't get any like weird vibes from him or anything like that. I can read people pretty well. And he just starts talking about, you know, his story. And he just seems so genuine about his story. Like he fully 100% believes in his story. And he gets out his phone and he starts just showing me all these videos and all these pictures that you can't actually see on his Instagram account. He hasn't shown a lot of them to very many people, but there was one <clears throat> that really stood out to me. And it was when he was trying to figure out if he should write his book or not. He, I mean, a lot of the things that he, that happens or that he has questions about, he turns to this phenomenon, which he believes are angels. Um, and he asks them, you know, for some sort of like, uh, some sort of answer and so he goes out there and he's trying to figure out if he's supposed to write this book or not. And he calls to the heavens and this giant orb about the size of a plane is about, it's like a bright red flamed orb and it just sprouts wings and it starts flying through the sky. And he wow. shows me this video and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like, is this real? Like, is this real? Because this is before I've experienced the phenomenon. So mm -hmm. I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, this is just wild. Right. And that was his, his reason for writing the book. Cause that was his yes com confirmation. Mm -hmm. And so, shows so the video of it happening. Yes. He shows me that video and not a whole lot of people have actually seen that video, but even when we're sitting there talking, he's getting messages from people from NASA um, he's voice messaging back and forth with a guy from NASA who's going to be night watching that night um, because apparently people who have come to visit him, they take that phenomenon home with them. So they end up being able to experience the orbs afterwards and but but being able to have like a, a very big experience like the ones that he has shown me is usually only around him and his family. So oftentimes mm -hmm. these people will go home and they'll be able to like see them in the sky and, and things like that. But Chris has these like very sensational experiences. Um, and the more often that you go to see him, the experiences for you actually get greater. And he was talking about how he just had someone there the night before who had actually seen the white lady that he talks about in his book, which is mm -hmm. who he calls the Holy Spirit and had presented herself to him and so I was just like oh my gosh this is just like getting me so pumped up and and you know I'm wondering if I'm gonna experience anything and so um we go out there and we sit down and we start looking up at the sky and he's voice messaging back with this guy from NASA because the guy from NASA is like I'm sitting out here with my with my mom we're watching the fire and I would love for you to send over any vibes that you want. We're doing night watching. I want to see if you can send any orbs over our way <laughs> and, and see if we can see anything. Um, and the guy calls it quantum entanglement, the NASA mm -hmm. guy, um, because if you can see the same orb in the sky and this guy was in Maine. And so, mm -hmm. and we were in North Carolina and he goes, if you can see the same orb in the sky going the same direction at the same time, that's called quantum entanglement. And so uh, we're sitting there and I'm looking up at the sky and I see it he's like, Oh, there it is. And I see this like small little ball going across the sky. And I'm like, Oh, you know, in my mind, I'm like, that's a satellite, you know? And so I start like trying to keep my eye on these things. And then all of a sudden, like these balls would get closer to us and they would get brighter and they would be different colors. And I'm like, okay, those are definitely not satellites because satellites have a trajectory that's pretty pretty consistent it just goes straight across the sky um 
And these things were moving in various different directions, which satellites do not do. Mm -hmm. And they were turned, they were different colors. And then we saw these like little streakers going across the sky, across mm -hmm. the sky. And he's like, Oh, you know, those are called streakers. It's where they kind of flash and then they look like a falling star, but they're, but you can definitely tell it's mm -hmm. like a light. Um, and then at one point I felt like, I needed to look behind me and I looked behind me and about 50 feet in front of me, there was a large tree and I looked over and there was a giant orb about the size of a soccer ball. And it was, it was the color yellow. And right when I looked at it, it went boom. And then it like just disappeared. And I went, Oh my gosh, I just saw it. And Chris was like, what did you see? And I was like, it was a giant yellow orb right there. And I was like, I don't know if I saw it because it just disappeared, but it was there. And he was like, no, that was, that was the Holy spirit. And I was like, really? And he goes, yes, that was just for you. That was just for you. And I was thinking like, you know, it, like all of a sudden I'm just getting like my energy is going up. And then, mm -hmm. and then my boyfriend and him look behind him, behind them. And they look up at the sky and they go, oh my gosh, there it is. And they looked and I turned around and looked up and there was a giant white glow that just like, like shot up into the sky and then it started to dim down and then it like moved behind the tree. And that night we saw about 30 orbs and it was insane. We got this, um, he has like this night vision video camera that he mm -hmm. uses mm -hmm. to record these things. Um, and we were, sorry, there's a fly that always <laughs> loves to come in <laughs> when I'm talking. Um, and so I'm looking through this night camera. I didn't even know that it records, um, but I'm looking at it and I'm seeing all of these orbs and I'm looking through it. And he's like, and there was a giant red one that appeared and then it turned into three different ones. And I was just like, oh my gosh, wow, wow, this is just crazy. And he's like, oh, well, hit record. And I, I was like, where's record? So I finally hit the record button and I only got the last glimpse of it. But he sent mm -hmm. me the video. I have the video and I showed it on my um, Chris Bledsoe episode mm -hmm. on my podcast. And um, and yeah, like the whole time, like every time one of these things would show up, he would be like, thank you. And he would be praying. So the entire time it wasn't like we were doing any sort of ritual or like summoning mm. or any of that kind of stuff. It was like he initially started praying and he was like, you know, asking God, the father, Holy spirit, if they want to present themselves to present themselves. And when the things started happening, you know, he was like, you need to say, thank you, you know, gratitude, be grateful. And so we were praying the whole time. And, um, one thing I will say is, you know, I had conversations with him and his son. So his son is actually going to be on my podcast tomorrow. And then I'm going to be going up November 18th to to be on his son's podcast. But we're going to be doing night watching on the beach with his son because his son has a lot of the experiences as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started talking to them afterwards. I'm like, this is the things these are the things I'm wrestling with in my mind because I don't know if this is good or if this is bad. And basically, Chris told me, you know, he gave me some very specific examples in the Bible that talk about clouds and how, you know, there's these clouds that come in with balls of fire and light and they're angels and, and that kind of stuff. And he he talks about how the devil um, cannot communicate with you in your own mind. Um, and Chris communicates telepathically with these entities. They show him pictures and stuff like that in his own mind. Um, but the devil can influence you, but the devil cannot, you know, take over and, and speak to you mentally. Um, and so he believes that these are, you know, coming from God, like angels and spirits, and that there is an evil force in this world, but that's not what we're dealing with. Um, and that he's like, you know, there could be aliens out there, but these aren't aliens, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of the stuff that I've just been diving into with like this holographic universe, this light matrix, um, you know, quantum physics, quantum mechanics, 
a lot of it, I feel like, is just explaining a lot of what we're experiencing um, and that there's good and then there's bad. And it's more of, you know, that's what I'm trying to wrestle with right now. Um, because I can't definitively say like, yes, I believe it's all good. I'm trying to figure out if there's like this dichotomy where it's, you know, we do have evil things that manifest themselves in this world. And then we also have things that were talked about in the Bible. And yeah. one thing that's hard to, uh, I mean, with Christians nowadays, they automatically, anything like this that happens, they automatically want to say that it is a demonic force that we're dealing with demons and all that kind of stuff. But it makes me question because it's like, well, during the, the, when the Bible was written, I mean, it talks about all throughout the Bible, all these miracles that happen, all of these angels that come and speak and, you know, prophetic dreams and, and speaking prophetically to them and showing them visions and, and coming in and, and being balls of fire and balls of light and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. How come that can't happen nowadays? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where yeah. if that does happen nowadays, Christians automatically are like, nope, nope. It's automatically the devil. It's almost like we've been pre-programmed to, to see evil, you yeah. know, to, to, to see the, the bad in everything. Um, cause it, I've, after like listening to that show of yours, it got me thinking about the, um, like just whatever this, like, current disclosure thing is that's going on uh and it because it, it always points to these things being a threat you know there's always that underlying thing of the there is an underlying threat to them but let's be perfectly honest that like the people that are telling us these things especially when it comes out of government um tunnels these are not the type of people that we'd normally trust about anything anyway mm-hmm so it's it it definitely it, it points me to that idea of maybe these maybe 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 the, there's people that want us to believe these things are bad. Yes. The, um, oh, go you've ahead. The whole threat you've got the the threat things been going on for a while now, um, and and now we we've all been saying it, it is it's so odd mm -hmm. that all of a sudden you get in. Um, I mean. We, we we had the aliens in Peru that turned out to be miners with jetpacks. I don't know if you saw that no. case, which which was He's crazy. He's being sarcastic. Did They're not actually miners with jetpacks. Hold the on. news put that out. Is that yeah, the, the is that the case that you're talking about with that guy who went on Joe Rogan saying that um that was that a recent case, the one in Peru? Or was yeah, this one that was a few was it about a month or so ago? A month, month ago, or two, yeah. yeah. Okay. It hit very I very much. That one. Yeah, it hit very much to be perfectly honest, apart from a like a, a grainy video, which has a load of people like shouting and screaming at trees. Um, and then there was a body that was washed up, which that that looks really weird because I think it's a body of a real person. But it's oddly, oddly enough, the the person looks very much like your um, uh, logo, because half of the flesh is being eaten off his face, but it's down to white bone, like it's he's clean. Uh, it looks very much like the uh, cattle mutilations and stuff that it, that people have seen. But this happened in July, and then mm. there was supposedly something else was attacking villages uh, like a month ago. But the official story that came out was it was illegal miners pretending to be aliens on jetpacks to scare mm. the the locals. Now, I didn't believe it was aliens until they tried to tell me there was jetpacks involved. <laughs> <laughs> that is insane. I've actually seen that video uh, lingering around of, of the guy who like washed up yeah. and then had half of his face gone. But I didn't yeah. like look into the case any further than that because to be honest with you i've talked to chris about this because i i'm like you know how come people are terrified how come people when they have like if you read chris's book and i don't know if you guys have yet but i have um you have yep it for the majority of like the beginning of the book you know he he's terrified of these things his family's terrified um he's 
he's getting more and more depressed. He basically gets to a, a point in his life where he's like, why is this happening to me? You know, like, mm -hmm. leave me alone. I don't want to talk about this anymore. I don't want to talk about UFOs, aliens, nothing. Like, I'm done with this. I'm done. Mm -hmm. Just leave me alone. Leave my family alone. They're dealing with all of this stuff. And that just seems like so much darkness, right? And then all of a sudden he has this encounter with the white lady who who he believes is the Holy Spirit. And she says, you know, you signed up for this. You agreed that you would you would tell the world about your experience and tell the world about us. And from this point forward, I'm going to support you. I'm going to, uh, you know, be there with you throughout the whole thing. And then after that, it was like everything started changing. And before that, he couldn't even record or take pictures of this mm -hmm. phenomenon. And then afterwards, all of a sudden it was like he was, he was able to, and he, and it was so interesting too, because he showed me a video of his wife trying to take a picture of one of these orbs and she would point the camera towards the orb and try to take a picture and it wouldn't take a picture. And mm -hmm. then she pointed it the other way and it would take a picture and then point it back and it didn't take a picture. Um, and so it, it was like the phenomenon or, you know, after that whole thing happened, it was like he was given the ability to have the support and the evidence to tell his story. And then, you know, now all these all these things are happening for him. Um, but, you know, it's you know, I asked him, I'm like, you know, why do people have such negative experiences? Like, you know, and he's he basically um, he, he also referred it back to the Bible. He, he refers a lot of things back to the Bible, but he says, you know, even in the Bible, when angels have appeared, people have been terrified and afraid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the angels will say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Like, you know, and so a point that I made in my episode was like, um, why would people be afraid if it's this all loving energy, you know? And apparently, even just in the Bible, people were afraid and terrified. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, it's just like, I don't know. I, I don't know if these are different things that we're dealing with. Um, if we're if we're thinking on a dimensional level. Um, Have you ever seen biblical uh, accurate representations of angelic figures created by AI? No. I'll, I'll okay. post. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, you should check that out. Like I also know like the translation, and I knew this before. He's he, his the lady professor of theology and religion that he references in there, she points it out to him that uh, Seraphim translates in older languages to the burning ones. And when you look in it, like from Enoch or whatever, or the book of Yasher, if you get into like the Gnostics, um, they're terrifying creatures. Like they're built with purpose and power. I mean, yeah. I mean, we're little things compared to something like that. But when yeah. he brings those up, they're interesting. Yeah. I, I, I read the book. I watched your podcast. I watched several other, uh, I'm really a big fan of your, uh, Something we need to learn how to do, guys, is uh, stay on topic and do research. <laughs> <laughs> we have not mastered that at all. No, We're more like no, sitting yeah. around having a beer and the conversation just sort of goes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, I will tell you, I wish I could do that because sometimes, you know, I, I envy people who can pump out content. I'm like, man, I wish I could just get on there and already be an expert on all of this stuff and like just be able to talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like, I can't pump out episodes very quickly because I get so sucked into the research part. There's so much research in it, you know? Have you always been interested? Yeah. So sorry, Dave. Have you yes. always been interested in like conspiracies and like odd things? Oh, I've, okay. So from the, ma ma oh, actually the majority of my life, I've always been attracted to like paranormal um, when I was a child and this is, seems kind of dark, but I grew up in a really like, uh, I grew up in not a great home environment. And so I used my like time to kind of escape my reality, if that makes sense. And so oftentimes I would be like, my brain would be in many different places trying to figure out reality. And it would always draw me towards like, paranormal things, scary things. I think for the majority of my childhood, I had like night terrors until age 13 and had very vivid dreams. And I was terrified of aliens. 
like for about seven years of my childhood, I would not go outside because I watched fire in the sky and I thought aliens were real. <laughs> and so every time I would go outside, I would look up at the sky and think that stars were spaceships and all that kind of stuff. So I was, I had this like weird connection to aliens, like the majority of my childhood. And then mm -hmm. after that, after like just being in, constricted to fear most of my childhood, it kind of turned into a curiosity after that. And I started just kind of like, I mean, I would always research. I'm, I'm just a researcher. Um, I like learning new information. And that was kind of what I flocked towards. But what I'll tell you is that in 2020, um, when we were isolated in our homes from the COVID pandemic, I started like, you know, trying to figure out what to do. So obviously I'm researching, you know, looking into politics, which I never, ever had an interest in politics. I thought it was like the most boring thing in the world. But that was like one thing I really wanted to look into because of all this Trump stuff. Like there was so many people talking about Trump and I'm like, you know, I want to look into this. So then that led me down like this red pill like mm -hmm. journey. Right. And when that yeah, happened, I think 2020, we, we all hit the uh, um, fall of the cabal and stuff like that train. Yeah. The, <laughs> I was Consp raised on that, man. Conspiracy, conspiracy <laughs> theorists. Did you guys okay made me watch that. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we so, did. You liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody sent that to me, and that was actually the first, the first thing where I go, "Oh, what the fuck is going on here?" Mm. I'm like, I need to like look into this because if this is real, you know, like what the hell's going on? So that led me down that path, and I will tell you, I'm not a QAnon conspiracy theorist mm. at all. Yeah. But yeah. it did red pill me and it sent me down this like crazy journey. And since that time, and by the way, I was, you know, at that time, I, my show just came out on 90 Day Fiance. And so it was like it hit like number one reality show for a period of time during the pandemic because everyone was like sitting at home, you know. And so <laughs> Lee's favorite. Then, <laughs> yeah so yeah, the network it was one of my guilty reality tv show pleasures with 90 day fiance was <laughs> yeah, yeah, we yeah. have we one of our fans uh is was actually on it oh god big yeah. ed little ed yeah. as a, loves, as a us, loves us as a resemblance wait, hold on. to uh did he to... do you, wait are you serious no not at all okay i was like did you photoshop <laughs> Yes, <laughs> we Photoshop everything. I was like, wait, I would have never ever figured that with Big Ed. Uh, but yeah, Big Ed was the my logo season. Suits him. Yeah, and so okay, so <laughs> when my show came out, all of a sudden, you know, well, the network was like already had me in line to do a bunch of other shows, and I'm I'm sitting there getting conflicted in my mind now, thinking like the media is corrupt and. There's this narrative with with television. Do I want to be a part of it and all that kind of stuff? And and so I started speaking out on my my platform, which was actually growing pretty big. And the network kept calling me, Avery, you can't you got to take that down. You got to take your story down. You got to take that post down. And I was like, no, no, I'm not going to. And they're like, if you want to stay in television, then you need to be quiet like you need to you're under contract, all that kind of stuff. And, and pretty much got to the point where I'm like, um, I'm just going to do my own thing because I'm not going to sit here and like fall in line, be told what to do, what to say and, and how I need to be and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I ended up, you know, just saying, okay, fuck it. So I did two shows and then the network basically turned their back on me. I lost a ton of sponsors um, they came out calling me a racist, uh, that, you know, cause I came out on my platform saying, I don't support BLM, the organization. Mm -hmm. I'm like, obviously black lives matter. Okay. We all know that black lives matter. Everybody matters, but the organization I don't trust. So oh. I'm not going to come out and on my big platform and support it. And then all of a sudden it like, I had a petition going around to get me canceled off television and there was you know, it, it was just a huge thing. So then that led me on a new journey where I'm like, okay, now I can explore the things I want, say the things I want. Now I've got nobody telling me 
what to say or do. And then from that, I got a bunch of other sponsors that came in and was like, you know, we don't care about any of that kind of stuff. We'll support you. And so it was tough there for a little bit, but that was kind of like what got me on this train. And now I can't stop. No, it's, it's interesting because I, I wanted to ask you that actually, whether with you sort of having that like brush into I'd I'd say up to the up to the wall of like get the like the Hollywood like film fame sort of thing, where there was there was clearly a way in for you for there. Whether yeah. you'd seen any of the um or uh, ex- experienced any of like the pushback that co- that comes with that sort of stuff that we hear, but yeah, I mean that yeah, it's, it's dead interesting the idea that even back then the thinking slightly out of line with what what these people want you to think with is just an instant red flag for them so it's just like yeah you, you either stop this now or you, you, we we can't have anything to do with you anymore yeah and def- if, oh i'm sorry go ahead i was just say you've definitely made a worthwhile transition <laughs> it's a lot more funner and i love like i don't know i've met like my people i feel like because for a long time, just being in reality, or I mean, just even in reality television, I met a lot of people and they were so fake. And I like, who, who is it? Christina. Um, she she was on Selling Sunset on, on Netflix and now she's she's huge. Uh, she's like on the cover of all these magazines and she's got like millions of followers now. Well, her season came out around the time that I did. And she tried to recruit me to be a part of like this good looking girls group to help each other, you know, become bigger and bigger, like reality stars. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll come into your group. So I went into the group and she had all these rules. It was like, you can't talk to ugly people. You can't recruit <laughs> ugly people. Oh, you couldn't and- have gone on this show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'd be off. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, but it, I think quite just dashy, obviously. Yeah, and <laughs> and I'm like sitting there in this group, and all the all of them are so fake, and and like I'm just like, dude, I I can't relate to any of you guys. Like, I cannot be this type of person. I just I everywhere I was, I was uncomfortable because people were just so showy, so mm. fake, and just you know like. I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. So when I started getting into this, you know, podcasting and just being around this, I like, I was like, man, I found my people. I love it. I can sit here and talk about this stuff all day long and not be judged. You know? <laughs> Have you had any uh, negative side effects from your research? On the woo woo side, when you start going, especially like I, I, you did a great series on Satanism, the temple of set, mm-hmm. the occult. It was well researched. It was well done all the way to the San Francisco unfortunateness out there. Um, it was really good. Like Thank very you. few people have done one that, that well. Um, and it's kind of a, I don't know. It's, it's a follow of mine, but um, <laughs> would you, did you like the hitchhiker phenomenon? If you go to places, it happens or you get the paranormal flu, like what happened to Lee. Um, but when you research these things for people who haven't like in depth, things happen. It's like mm-hmm. a, it's an attraction. Did you have any of that occur for you or did you, what yeah. did you get to escape it? Uh, it like, it's, it's funny you say that because, um, when I first started my Satanism series, I, I was like, you know, I come from a standpoint where obviously I have a Christian background. So the only thing I know about Satan is what everybody is saying right? In the Christian Mm -hmm. world, you know, biblical and all that kind of stuff. But what I had questions with in my own mind was all these people who, who practice Satanism or believe in that, you know, they talk about how they don't actually believe in Satan and, you know, they're against harming children. They're against all this stuff. And there's this narrative that's out there that obviously like there's this pedophile cabal that's like running the world and and all this stuff and people are posting symbolism and and trying to tie all these dots together that there's this satanic cult out there and i just couldn't find any evidence for obviously there's all these dots that people connect 
to point to something that's there. But what I was like, okay, I need to figure out what they believe because I know what this side believes, but now I need to go on the other side and see what they believe. So I started going down that and, and just researching what they believe. And I was like, this is weird. You know, they don't actually believe in Satan and they are against harming children. And some of their beliefs I can actually get behind because that's kind of how my brain works too. But, and, and it was really like, initially it was just kind of like, okay, I don't really necessarily see what is wrong with that belief system. But then I started having these satanic dreams mm -hmm. and it was like, it almost started right off the bat. And I wasn't even like looking at anything satanic. I was just reading some of the literature that they mm -hmm. have and that even talks about, you know, doing good to others and, and all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden I'm having these satanic dreams and my energy is getting really low. And about, I, I did a four part episode and I couldn't even finish the fourth part. I had to take a month long break from my podcast because my energy was just so, so like drained. And mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out where that was coming from because usually I can go, go, go. And once I started researching into the Temple of Set with Michael Aquino, that's where the story kind of started changing because Michael Aquino he believed in Satan, you know, and he called him set and mm -hmm. that, you know, he believed that he was like the second beast of, in the book of revelation and that Aleister Crowley was the first beast mm -hmm. in the book of revelation. And so I, yeah, like all of a sudden all these things started happening and, you know, I, people were giving me advice on like how to get rid of that energy and, think positively. And I just felt like I was getting so sucked into it yeah. that I couldn't get out because I was just doing so much research. And I'm like, okay, I have to take a break and like put positivity around me. And, you know, I came back with a lot of energy, but then I started this David Hamblin case because when I was researching into the Presidio daycare center from the satanic panic, which was tied to Michael Aquino. Um, and if people don't know what that is, it was, you know, it was a daycare that was in the San Francisco um, military base and Michael Aquino was stationed there. And there were children who stated that Michael Aquino had a, abused them along with, you know, some other people and that this was a satanic cult that was, you know, ritualistically abusing children. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then it just got dismissed. It got like, you know, chalked away in court and as a satanic panic and all that stuff. Well, I stumbled upon the the David Hamblin case, which he just got arrested a year ago for satanic ritual abuse on children, which stem back to the satanic panic era. And that raised my like I was like, OK, now I'm trying to figure out if these children have been abused because you have two different narratives out there. So then I started researching into the David Hamblin case and that got so dark and I'm still in it. I have, I'm about five episodes on my premium Rockfin channel um, diving into the victim statement. So I have all the mm -hmm. police reports. I have all the videos from the police interviews. And no media is actually out there talking about it because I presume, because it's really heavy, but also they don't want to start another satanic panic. Um, but it's in court right now. It's occurring. It's happening. And people are slowly getting arrested for it. And so... I've been dissecting the victim statements and what they state. And all of a sudden these dreams are coming back mm -hmm. and my energy is getting low again. And it's like, so I'm now I'm working out a balance. I'm mm -hmm. like, I can only do this during this period of the day. And the rest is listening to positive podcasts, positive uh, <laughs> motivational <laughs> videos, um, you know, yeah. trying to like, keep peace in my life but um but yeah it's crazy how that happens you just get into it and it starts get into your brain so no you sorry dave do you think there's a um like a, a a spiritual aspect about that or is it or just consuming too much dark material i think it's both 
to be honest, mm -hmm. because when I think about how I had just started reading about the left hand path philosophy, which you have right hand path philosophies, which include a lot of the Abrahamic religions, they basically I mean, the the difference between them is that right hand path path philosophies believe that there is an exterior God and we are trying to align ourselves with a higher power. Um, and the left hand path philosophy basically means that we are the higher power. We can manipulate around us to be more like what we want. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like you have people who think that they can be gods and then you have this side of the of the coin where it's like people want to align with some sort of higher power. So it's like mm -hmm. the reverse. And you have the Eastern and Western religions that fall into each one. And so with the left-hand path philosophy, that's where Satanism stems from. And, uh, and you know, I'm reading into some of these things and it's like not even bad stuff. And I'm getting these satanic dreams, you know? Um, and so, and, and my energy is draining. And this was like mm -hmm. when my energy wasn't drained. This was just like when it first started. Mm -hmm. So I really think that it has a lot to do with both because... Even just when I was doing the Satanism series, I noticed I was wanting to watch more true crime. I was want like every second that I had, I was wanting to consume more darker material, if that makes sense. It was almost mm -hmm. like it was it was like attached to me mm -hmm. and wanting to suck me further into it. And I needed to pull myself out. And one thing that really stood out to me, I had a paranormal investigator on my podcast who um, who did a award-winning show called The Witching Hour. And they've they've caught a lot of paranormal on camera, but they're also religious. So I'm like, how, how do you deal with that? And he goes, people think that when you get a dark force attached to you, that it's like an exorcism, right? We, like we have, we we think that people are possessed and they're, you know, they're spewing vomit and they're doing all this weird stuff, right? Just because mm. of what television has told us. But he's like, it's not like that at all. It's actually just a dark energy that comes in and starts to manipulate your actions. It's like starts drawing you more towards things you shouldn't be doing. Um, it, it gets into your head. You start getting a little bit more depressed and, you know, you don't even know that this darkness is within you. And, and that kind of stood out to me because, you know, before that I thought, oh, well, if you have a dark force attached to you, you know, all of a sudden you, you turn into a different person. But it's like, no, it it changes you over a period of time, like brings you more towards the darkness. You mentioned something, was it the tinfoil hat you were on recently with mm -hmm. uh, and you were talking about this case um, and you, you mentioned that about the wife didn't she had no clue that she'd uh, ab abused was it the daughter she'd had mm -hmm. no idea and he said that he he knew he'd, he admitted to it but he said something made me do it mm -hmm. do, that's do you, a do you believe that that is a thing or that was always kind of in the guy do you think that's possible that people can be corrupted by evil and start out good i 100 percent believe that um with the david hamblin case if if what the st statements are saying in the victim statements are true then david hamblin was always in a very dark situation because they have talked about how this is a multi-generational thing that they were raised in a multi-generational satanic cult which stemmed from the grandparents and you know, it, it went back all the way to like the beginning of, I mean, his bloodline went way, way back. And this was something that was passed down from generation to generation. And so he had always been in it and he had, he was baptized at a very young age into the satanic cult. And so, but, but one thing I had noticed because I also am a true crime fan, I follow a lot of like murder cases, serial killers and that kind of stuff because I'm fascinated by the mind. I am fascinated by what makes people do what they do. And there's an ongoing theme that I see with all serial killers and they, 
like they'll they'll talk about this and it s sticks out to me every single time i'll tell you about jeffrey dahmer okay jeffrey dahmer his last victim that basically got him caught because he had ran out of the house mm -hmm. when right before he was about to be killed but he went on the st the stand and testified and what he testified was that <clears throat> jeffrey dahmer was super kind he was really nice when when they first went back to the apartment, offered him a drink and all that kind of stuff. And then they went to the bedroom and he decides he's going to turn on The Exorcist 3, I believe it was. That was the yes, movie he, was. he always wanted to play. And he goes, right when he did that, he turned into a different person. And it was like he he would stare at you and it was like he was staring into your soul and he was really dark and he started rocking back and forth and he, it was almost like he went into a trance and the only reason why he was able to escape was because Jeffrey Dahmer was rocking back and forth and it was like he was in a trance it was like he was getting prepared to mm -hmm. do what he was going to do um, but he basically ran out during that time that is a consistent theme that I see very often with with serial killers when I watch their interrogation videos or their interviews and they talk about oftentimes like I, it's something within me. It's mm -hmm. like a dark force that's within me that is propelling me to do these types of things. And so the David Hamblin case, when he's like, I am so sorry, I raped you. Like he said that on video. Um, he said, I'm so sorry, I raped you. I'm not saying that it didn't happen, but I'm saying that, it wasn't me. It was the dark force that was in me that did it. And so I definitely believe that, you know, you can have these dark forces that propel you to do things and then you can come out of that and be like a normal human being. And I think that's where you have, you know, people who go through really traumatic experiences where it disassociates parts of their brain. And they have to have certain triggers in order to access that part of their brain. Um, you know, I wonder if that has something to do with it as well, because they have to figure out how to be evil as well as also be a contributing member of society. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like they have these triggers that they use to get them into the state of mind that they act if that makes sense. It's the ritual they use to access that part of what they need to do or to allow that, whatever that is. There's a, actually a more recent one. It's not as famous, but uh, it's a celebrity. I don't know if you're familiar. It's a South African band called Die Ant Word. And yeah. um, the, well, they're, they're not well known. <laughs> uh, but the male from the group human trafficked a girl from South Africa. I'm sorry, not from Dude, South Africa, I, from I, Australia. I know who that band is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so Ninja, them. the guy, did you hear about that? No, no. There's a girl that he trafficked from Australia. She was a fan and he offered, like, she's very young, like 16 or something, 15. He's like, I'll buy you a plane ticket. You'll come out here. I really like your art. And she's an active, or at least at that time, was like an active, quote unquote, Satanist, wannabe witchy person, you know, and he brought her out and um, they kind of went on this weird date thing. And he explained how his relationship with this on and off again, wife, baby mama, music partner person work anyway you can watch the whole thing it's a it's a it's all out there the diane word uh sexual assault and you'll you'll find that people have documented it well but his whole claim was and, and that's even what the girl said that he just kind of turned into a different person and he even said that he has like a a demon that comes through and does those things and the kids that they would adopt were all handicapped or disformed and people thought well that's really great that you're helping out these kids it turned out they just used them and then some of the kids came out and talk about things going on in the house and the things that they really believe, like really believe. And you're just like, hmm. And it all just, you know, nobody wants to pick up on it. No one wants to talk about mm -hmm. it because that's going to mess with Sony's distribution. And no one wants that to happen because we need mm -hmm. to push for this product. And everyone just kind of keeps trucking along. Uh, yeah. Money and power is the most evil thing in this world. It, it basically runs the world. I mean, money and power can get people to do crazy things. Um, and just off of what you said, there are other parts in the victim's statement that talked about how before David Hamblin would abuse these girls, mm -hmm. sometimes he would, he 
would turn on certain music in his car and it was like heavy metal or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he, he would turn into a different person. He'd start growling and howling and he would turn into like a beast and he would yell at them and tell them run and he would give them a head start. And then he would get out of the car and just start howling and barking and running. And it's like, but he needed the music to turn him into that you need the ritual. person. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That reminds me of, um, cause I always, I, I always say this, I think in, in Hollywood, in movies and TV programs, there is like little hints to what, what life is about. And have you seen, have you ever seen split? He, yes. he, he says run and he, he starts to growl and, he's because he's just yeah. got split personalities but it's almost like it is a demon taking over him and the woo we call that invocation invocation, invocation. of the familiar yeah oh, yeah that's why they need a ritual because the yeah. thing's always there it's attached it's around but other than perfect possession which is the shit you see on tv like the little like the small woman throwing men around the church you know what i mean Oh yeah. Um, it's normally exactly what you said. It wears you down. It wears your family down. It doesn't let you sleep. You know, that's where the scratching and the rattling and all that stuff comes to the night or the bad dreams or the, that way it can wear down the psyche. Once it wears down the psyche, then it can influence, mm -hmm. right? Makes you feel alone, makes people pull away from other people because it, you know, you're a terrible person. No one would like you. They don't really like you. They don't, you know, when that, none of that's true. Everyone does like you. Everyone's wondering, where are you at? That's why we're texting you. You should come out, you know? And it uh, once you're isolated, then you're you're just free. And then there's the difference. Uh, people with invocation and ritual, they're, they're walking on the doorstep of perfect possession, right? That's what, they're, that's what the goal is. But I don't think everybody can be. It's a different. It's a whole different show. But uh, <clears throat> I was going to say earlier that you're, for anyone listening, you definitely need to go check out Chiller Queen Podcast because your coverage of the San Francisco horribleness at the Presidio is fantastic. Thank you. It is fantastic. That case is not talked about enough. Uh, yes. Everyone just brushes it by. Everyone's afraid of the guy. Everyone's afraid of his people uh, you, with reason. <laughs> you know, it's can really we, can interesting. Can we go into that? I'm going to say, because I've, I've not watched this one. I, um, Chiller Queen, I've literally, Lee and Dave introduced me to your podcast, so I, I had not seen it before, but I've been, <laughs> I've been binge watching a couple of them, and I've seen, watched a couple of interviews. He is a terrible host. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> terrible. But this case is fascinating. Him. Terrible. Person. What is this case? <laughs> the Presidio Daycare uh, abuse scandal, um, which, by the way, during this time, there were thousands of cases popping up across the country that were just like the Presidio daycare abuse scandal. And it was, they were like the children who were involved. There were other military bases all over that had, that were saying, you know, the, the on-site daycare centers that were for the military base. Um, they were claiming that they were being ritualistically and satanically abused by a satanic cult. And the cases were very similar. Um, a lot of what the kids had stated were a lot of what you heard from the Presidio daycare uh, case. And what happened was is this daycare center that was located on the um, Presidio military base in San Francisco, that is where Michael Aquino was stationed. And Michael Aquino, it, I mean... If you look into him, he has he has a very extensive military background, but he like specialized in um, like he was a part of like mind control and MK Ultra and all right. of that kind of stuff. Um, and he knew tactics that were used and he also recruited other military people to do rituals with him on bases. And he he's even openly talked about that. Um, but Michael Aquino, you know, he stands by the fact that nothing that he does is bad. He doesn't harm children, any of that kind of stuff. But with the Presidio daycare center, it was it, these kids, basically, um, there were, was like a young girl, uh, or a young boy, I can't remember, but they came out saying, um, 
that they were being abused. And, um, and when the parents like took her to this store, uh, Michael Aquino and his wife were walking and she was like, Oh, those are the bad guys. That's, uh, Mikey and Shambi. And, Mikey and Shambi were the two people, which was him and his wife, who had actually uh, abused the kids, allegedly, is what the little girl said. And um, and so the FBI goes and raids his house and finds, like, you know, toys, finds a soundproof uh, room, and finds a, a bunch of stuff inside of his house, which the little girl had actually gone with the police and the police took her around the neighborhood where he lived and was like, you know, they started off uh, a few blocks up and was like, okay, point out where the house is. And she took them straight to the house where Michael Aquino lived and pointed out the house saying that, you know, that's where I get taken off of the daycare site and, and are brought there. And that it wasn't just her, there was multiple children that started saying that. And so they they stated that it was coming from or they were taking the kids off site to to various homes. And then they were also stating that the people who were in the daycare center were a part of it as well. And so they arrested them. They did a thorough investigation and they basically came to the conclusion that the parents and the therapists and the doctors that had evaluated these children, when the doctors evaluated the children, they did find signs that they were being abused. I mean, mm -hmm. you don't have a, a, a child getting a STDs. And mm -hmm. there were four children who had had STDs. And so you had evidence that these children were being abused, but some of the claims were so sensational um, that it was really hard to prosecute because there, I mean, there were so many kids coming forth. I think it was like a hundred and something kids from this daycare center that said that they had been abused, but the the claims were so sensational that the lawyer was like, oh, this won't hold up in court. This won't hold up in court. So he just chose 10 of the cases that he thought would do well in court that weren't so crazy. And it ended up that half of them couldn't even testify because they were too young. And then they stated that the therapists, the doctors, everybody involved were um, were behind some sort of like, you know, they didn't do it right. They didn't interview the children right, that they planted stuff in their brains. And, and I can see how that can be a part of it. But I don't see how you can't say that these children were abused in some way, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then they you ended up just a hundred times. The you know, it's, yeah. If, if when you have that many claims, it's the, you know there's clearly something going on. If it, you know, if you're talking four or five claims or something, <laughs> something you could say, well, maybe people are feeding information from some point. But that many is just it's incredible. Yeah, and the fact that there is evidence that there was abuse that happened, and that's what I'm finding with this David Hamblin case because the David Hamblin case, the daughters came out in 2012, and went to the police and told them all this stuff. They arrested David Hamblin and even had the video evidence of the daughter going to the father and saying, hey, why did you rape me? And he, him expressing that, I'm sorry I raped you, but it wasn't me. It was like something within me. And they still couldn't prosecute him because there's so much claims inside of this statement where it's like, it's really hard to say what is real and what isn't because when you have some or, or children saying like people are being say like human sacrifices and, and children being mm -hmm. killed and all this kind of stuff. Well, where are the bodies? You know, mm -hmm. can we find evidence that have a body? Yes. Yeah, it sounds insane. Yeah. yeah. Um, I take it with going through this stuff as well. I can't remember what the case was now, but I know it was in, it was in England where there was the two, British kids that um, were uh, saying in an interview that they were being uh, like satanically ritually abused and that they had to like kill and eat children in the day. Yeah. Yeah. It's see, I, I keep when, when these things pop up and even the, um, 
the, like the Savile story and like Jeffrey Epstein on the, the island. It, you, you do think, well, is this, is there just loads of small, well, small or cells of this stuff going on? Or is there something like interconnected with it all? And that's, that's what I don't quite get. That's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> because mm. it, it seems like there are different sects and there's these divisions because even just in the David Hamblin case, they are just an LDS Church of Satan. Mm. They are the inverse of the LDS religion. And then you have other satanic sects that are, you know, just like the one that just came out with the FBI, the Nine Angels. I don't know if you guys have heard about that one. Yeah. Oh, well, you need to look into that one because that the if the FBI just came out with a warning that there's a global satanic pedophile cult. Um and the only way that they <laughs> the only way that they Shocker. found <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> like we've been saying it for years, you know. Um but the only reason why they found it was because there was a guy, I can I think his name was Angel and he was arrested in 2021 for gun charges and when they went in and started looking through all of his stuff. Uh, they got his laptop and looked through all of his things and they found this forum and then they found all these images and then they found that there is like this nine angels satanic pedophile cult and that there's tons of members globally that are in there like abusing children and mm -hmm. doing all of this stuff. So they actually just came out saying that you know, obviously you don't have that all over the media, right? Talking about it. But if you go to the FBI website, there is a warning about it. Um, and so that's something separate than this David Hamblin case. But I believe, because even just looking at the victim statements, they talk about how they would trade children with other organizations. Mm. And so I feel like, you know, just even with like the black web, right? We don't mm -hmm. really know the black web. We don't know what is actually out there on the internet because we're not actively out there looking for these things. Mm -hmm. But there apparently is a whole side to the web that we don't even know or even understand, right? That and there's probably a whole side to the dark web that we don't even understand yeah. as well because the, 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 the idea with the, that you could have like websites which aren't searchable and are essentially just like what 20 or 25 digit codes on the end of like in front of a dot onion you would never accidentally find these websites mm -hmm. un unless you were given access to you've them. been introduced to them yeah exactly and so that is why i feel like this is something similar to that is mm. these people are they have a network that's behind the scenes you know see or i i'm sorry I, I was more went into the to the feeling that there must be something like like massive and connected with this stuff and oddly it was it was it was through the jeff jeffrey epstein thing but it was because of virginia guffrey because the when prince andrew sort of the all that all came out about him um it's it was a perfect smokescreen for that whole thing because nobody cares about Prince Andrew. Not even the royal family care about P Prince Andrew. He's a, He was the disposable royal. Um, <laughs> I know. The, they uh, literally disowned him afterwards. It was like, yeah, it was like, pff, fine. Thrown but, to the uh, wolves. Uh, legal uh, age of consent in the UK is 16. So Virginia, mm -hmm. Virginia Guffrey at the at the time was 17 so even in his country of origin she wasn't underage mm -hmm. um she was also she also looked very like she looked like she was in her 20s you know in that photograph with him and him and her together and i think it even when her her documentary came out on netflix it it made it sound like some sort of like billionaire's pleasure island with like teenagers and like twenty year old models, and they were they were they were scooping go, like like model like wannabe models up and bringing them over to this island, and I think it's because it's, that's what they want us to think is going on in these places. If you look I, at the history where they grab some of those girls, 
like not just the ones that got away, but the ones like the girls talk about, but nobody can mm-hmm. find. Like, where'd you get them? Warsaw. Really? Really? Moscow? Interesting. All the different stand countries, they grab the dark haired pretty girls or the blondes or the whatever they get. They, you know, rarely would they recruit from European countries. Hmm. Yeah. You know, it's harder to track. It's sad. Yeah, and that was like the, and I'll go back to the David Hamlin case. They they specifically talk in there about how much they have like done human sacrifices and, you know, even animal sacrifices and all this stuff. And the police are like, well, where are these bodies? And, you know, where are these children? We should obviously have missing children and stuff like that. And they go, no, they got these children from the Indian reservations as well as these polygamy groups that don't document their children. Um, Mm -hmm. They don't even oftentimes have birth certificates or social security numbers. And so, and because this is a multi-generational thing, you oftentimes have the mother, the father, the brothers, the sisters, the grandparents all in on it. And Mm -hmm. so if they're doing some sort of like human sacrifice, they oftentimes will go to these polygamous groups that are that they'll exchange things for like i will give you art or i will give you money in exchange for one of your children and then you don't have these parents because they're in on it Mm -hmm. coming forth and saying you know i have a missing child or something like that um these children are undocumented and that's oftentimes why they go to colombia and they go to all of these other third world countries because oftentimes parents can't afford to even have their children and will sell their children for money Mm -hmm. and you know you don't really see a lot of recruitment here in these well-established countries you know like first Mm -hmm. world countries because it's just it's harder to escape the system so talking about like jumping right back to the dark web because we bounce around a lot um, there's a, a guy out there called Ryan in Montgomery. I wanted to remember his name specifically. I remember his handle zero day, which I thought was funny. So zero day is, uh, in the hacking world, like an unknown exploit. He's the ethical that hacker caught. that was He's on the Sean most Ryan. Correct. He's the most yeah. ethical hacker in the world. He's like the number one white hat hacker. He wasn't always, but you know, whatever. Hey, <laughs> we all do things. Uh, but anyway, he kind of got into, like he's always been in the dark web and different things. And a friend of his, uh, he's on the Sean Ryan podcast. It's worth going and checking out uh, that episode. Um, he threw a friend. She had, uh, well, he was, her daughter was talking to someone. He got concerned. She hooked him up with the person. He doing what he can do, you know, looks him up, starts going through all their personal stuff because he can do that. And then finds a link to this website, goes to the website on the dark web. And, um, it's filled with all these different. It was actually ran by a guy running for po- office in Virginia that, or oh, held office in Virginia. I know that story. That he wasn't on the dark in, web. That was that was. Oh, a, that was on the regular web. No, yeah, so he yeah. also has. So it had a mirror site on the dark web because he had talked about it. But that's probably what I'm thinking in my head. But anyway, mm-hmm. he turned all that into the FBI and they did nothing. Mm-hmm. So he he of course cloned the site. It has all their names and information, and he's been trying to figure out what to do. I know that story, and he's now been coming out talking about it. Yep. Um, which I think he finally had the site taken down or something like that, but he's still trying to get, he's going through the, he's mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. I, I remember watching him on an interview and he was like, I'm coming for all of you. Yeah. Got, like I'm going that, down right. <laughs> the, the list. Yes. Yeah. He's like, I have all of the receipts, but nobody's doing anything about it. Yeah. And so this is my experience. Okay, guys. And this is what blows my mind because Oftentimes, and this is where I think there's a lot of issues. Oftentimes, I think when there's something so big like this, it's like looked at as how many, how much resources we have to even put into this. Do we even take it on? And and this is some of the things that I have experienced just in this last couple of years. Because I am such a crazy researcher, Sometimes it leads me into these wild goose chases and I end up going after people. So there was this case with the Madeline McCann scam that just recently happened. This Polish girl Mm -hmm. came out saying she was Madeline McCann. 
And I found her spokesperson to be very sketchy because she was a psych celebrity psychic and she had solved all these murder cases or blah, blah, blah. Right. So I started looking into her and I, I found so much on this woman that I'm like, she is, she needs to be investigated thoroughly because I think she's part of human trafficking because of where everything led me to. And I, I think even her husband needs to be looked at. I have so much evidence on this woman. Like I was reaching out to her university asking if she had her doctorate and she does not. Um, I was, I have all these email exchanges. And then I finally went to the Texas board where her, where her private investigator license was. And I contacted them and said, this person is acting or she's practicing in California, which is illegal because in Texas, you can't practice outside of Texas. And I tried to get her license taken away. And then finally, when, when Julia was here in the United States, which is the Polish girl, um, she was being held against her will inside of that psychic's home. And I called the police for a welfare check at the house. The police showed up and it opened up a can of worms, which got her to go back to Poland. And when she went back to Poland, she started talking and she started saying all these things that the psychic was doing. And then the psychic came out saying, oh, well, Julia is a pedophile. And I found all these underage children on her phone. And I'm like, where did you get all those images of underage children? Like there was so much stuff that was being pulled up. And I took it and I was on the phone every single day with police. And you know what they kept telling me? They said, you're not the victim. Correct. Like you cannot file a report because you're not the victim. I kept getting like this this like it was like a wild goose chase i got a number to here That's a number like there then go to crime stop murder if you because you're not killed <laughs> yes and so There's i was like that. yeah so then i went to julia and i was like julia you need to file a complaint so she filed a complaint and i was like give me the number to the investigator because you don't have all the information i have so i will tell them i have so much evidence so then months later i get a call from the investigator I tell him, I literally start rolling off everything that I have. Mm -hmm. And you know what? He never called me back. He Correct. never called me again. And I'm like, okay, like what is the deal? It's insane. I'll tell you after the show. Okay. <laughs> but also I'll tell you this too with the David Hamblin case. All So because I went on the tinfoil hat with the David Hamblin case series, um, Sam reached out to me right afterwards and said that mm -hmm. David Hamblin's lawyers reached out to him mm -hmm. and he had to edit parts of his, the episode out. And now I have eyes on me. Correct. No I was just about I'm like, to that did not that. take long. Yeah. So if what he like, so the Hamblin claims or, or the claims are that Hamblin comes from a long line that this is hereditarily passed down and that he's into the occult. That to an observer signals certain things, and yeah, you you do a great job, you do a great job. But with that comes the rest, right? Oh yeah, yeah. And if they're trading people, they got money. Mm. Nothing's more valuable than people, especially people that don't exist. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's so, yeah, and it kind of makes me a little afraid sometimes because I'm like, well. Do I come out and keep doing this? Because apparently the deeper I go, then these people reach out to me. And it's even just weird, too, because I had an email from um, someone like a, a media group that was doing something with the David Hamblin case and told me that I can't say certain names that were in the in the case files. And I said, no, they weren't redacted. Yeah. They are public. So mm -hmm. I can say those names. I'm not doxing anybody. I'm not doing anything. And they tried to tried to sound smarter than I was and give me all of mm -hmm. these like words about, you know, what I'm supposed to say and what I'm not supposed to say. And I was like, no, I'm sorry. You're not going to get me to take down anything or change anything. I'm putting it out there. It's public knowledge. So if I'm getting the Freedom of Information Act information and it's in there, I can say it. 
You know what their next tactic will be, right? You're aware. You're smart. You're a smart woman. Well, you, you got to tell me. They'll start with phone calls. Uh, legal letters start first. Legal loan phone calls start first. And it usually goes through. If you have anyone they can contact, they'll do that through you so it's not direct. And then you'll see strangers who know your name at a grocery store and say hi because they're paid to do that. They're the pay I groups, law firms, employ people to do exactly that. That's terrifying. It's a good it thing is. I don't leave my home. <laughs> Keep ordering those groceries. <laughs> yeah, I just ordered my groceries and stay in my little my little hut step, upstairs. I'll come out later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be fine just Uber Eats VR helmet so you can see outside. Exactly. Uh, have you done any um, looking into the children that have supposedly gone missing in the uh, Maui fires? Uh, no, I have not because yet. The, uh, I, I was watching something the other day where the, the people were mentioning the children, the, the children had gone missing during the fires, but saying how weird it was that the lack of social media presence from parents on both sides of it. And this is, this is what really perked my interest because it there's nothing from parents going, I'm missing my child. And there's also, but there's nothing from people, uh, coming out saying what a great job like people are doing like looking for children and like things there's, there, there just seems to be no no talking about it whatsoever and how do how do they know that these children are missing then if school like the roles. parents are oh the schools because mm -hmm. all the children were set were, were apparently sent home with the, the um from school that day and then another researcher who is it must be true because it's on tiktok um the yeah the best and, uh, place for conspiracies yeah i mean did um, you know that it was going to be the zombie apocalypse yesterday i'm just yeah, saying of course it was I'm not convinced that. it wasn't did, did you have your phone turned off <laughs> just in case <laughs> uh but i did not actually I, I wanted to take in all that all that juice and see what happened that's what the fair day bags for man <laughs> Um, but this person that said that apparently on the day that the uh, the, the kids were supposedly sent home from school was a, was a national holiday anyway, so they shouldn't have even been in the school. So that part of the story seems weird. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's, there's something the 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 Maui fire situation. It seems odd to me. We've not even touched really on that. Oh, I don't oh, think we should. <laughs> should. <laughs> I I that's actually interesting because I. Sometimes I can't keep up with things now. I mean, Not I don't right know now. if you guys it, realize it, like, it's, it's almost much. daily yeah. that these things are coming out. And I'm like, dude, without how much I research, I can't, I can't like, I can't keep up. Well, so, there was something called the bullshit, um, like the bullshit conspiracy or the bullshit hypothesis. And the, the idea was that governments would feed, would, would feed, enough conspiracy theory onto the internet that it was impossible to keep up with and impossible to research. So everything becomes bullshit after that because mm -hmm. nobody knows what's real and what's not. It oh, feels, yeah. feels like that now. You just put out the truth and people are so flabbergasted and taken aback they can't accept it. Like, have you seen the video of the man dressed as a clown torturing that little kid, scaring him and yelling at him and dancing in his face to that song? I'm not going to say who the guy looks like. doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you see things like that, speaking of the Presidio, I refuse to say the guy's name. If you hadn't caught on, I'm not going to. I don't want to give him any due credit. I, Whatever. But like what you hear now in child abuse cases and things that are reported where people are wearing costumes and things are larger than that, it does sound like it was developed by military intelligence because that wasn't hypothetically would still be if torture was allowed by our U.S. government, which it is not. Um it's things so fantastical that when they black bag a normal guy off the street, the situation is so surreal and so beyond that anyone you tell is not going to believe you. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Makes sense. You had, well, you had federal agents black bagging people at different riots and protests, whatever you want to call it in different places. And the methods that they use are ridiculous. Like throwing people in the back of a snow cone truck. And I mean, seriously. And people are like, no, what? Because that one detail would be like, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You're going to tell me five men jumped out of a snow cone truck, put a bag on your head and threw you inside. What have you been on? No, that's genuinely what they do. I, I know the guys that did it. <laughs> you know, it's 
because nobody would believe that. Well, nobody would believe that. That is how I feel like these satanic cults operate. And and when David Hamblin and this was the basically after reading everything and researching into even therapists uh, interviews on what they experience because they're professionals in um, in treating children of ritual abuse and their stories and what a lot of them say. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have the same narratives. So there's this, you know, there's a group of there's groups of people who fully 100 percent believe what the victims are stating. And then you have other people or another group of people who 100 percent don't believe anything that they're saying. And they say it's way too sensationalized and mm -hmm. chalk it off as, you know, just didn't happen. And then I'm in the camp of like in the middle where I after looking at everything, I have come to the realization that, you know, David Hamblin was very proficient in programming and mental manipulation, psychological tactics. Um, and he used them in his therapy sessions and he did hypnosis on his patients. Mm -hmm. He tried to convince them that they had been abused in satanic, in a satanic cult. Um, and w when they hadn't, um, and I think that that is purposely done. So what the military is doing to us with conspiracies where we we can't even understand what's real mm -hmm. and what isn't real that's what they're doing to the brains of these victims by disassociating their brain they're mm -hmm. fragmenting their brain they're giving them false memories um they're putting so much into their mind that they fully 100 percent believe in what their experience is but then when they go to say, hey, I have been abused to the police and they say all of this stuff, then who's going to be able to prosecute that? Because you have mm -hmm. real mixed in with fake. Mm -hmm. And it oftentimes just goes to the wayside and doesn't further get investigated. And so I think that that is strategically done by these people who are, you know, harming victims but we can't definitively say what is actually true in their statements and what isn't true without obviously evidence. And we mm -hmm. have evidence that these people have been abused, but we're still trying to find this evidence of some of these other things, you know? And so that's what they're doing to the minds of their victims is just like mm -hmm. what the military is doing mm -hmm. with all of this conspiracy stuff. Or like social media is doing to us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's all, it's almost more terrifying that, isn't it? The idea that, like, it, it, on one hand, you have the, the thought that there might be this um, like separate, like splinter religion, which involves like satanic ritual abuse of kids. That it it almost feels worse that the satanic stuff might just be theater that's laid on top of it, because realistically, these guys just want to hurt kids. And it's, but that that's just laid over the top of it to make it seem so ridiculous. So these guys go, oh, "Do I really have to wear the robes? I just want to fuck the kids." Like, no, no, we wear the robes because we want to throw people off. If you that's want the local, worse. if you want the local prey, you gotta yeah. wear the costume. Yes, and then oftentimes you have these these random people who you know just grew up in a really bad household and end up being you know, troubled children who turn to Satanism and think Satanism is this certain thing and then go out and start doing dumb things and get caught for it. And, you know, those are the people who get put out into the the media as like, yeah, this there was ritual abuse, but those are like one offs and this guy's an mm -hmm. idiot, you know, and he really did believe in that and wanted to do it. But when we're talking about a sophisticated organization that's operating mm -hmm. behind the scenes, mm -hmm. I think it's very strategically done and it, it's, it's hard for us to even understand what's really going on because I think that it has to do with, there's a lot of elites involved. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that what they're doing creates a lot of money and power mm -hmm. and when you have that, you kind of control the world. And so they have to have some sort of like 
you know, if they're tied to the military, even, you know, and all those operations that they did to figure out how to do mental manipulation, mind control, all these different tactics, and then, you know, using those tactics that they know to cover their asses and Mm -hmm. not allow their organization to be revealed, you know, to Mm -hmm. whatever extent. So it's like, I think that they're a lot smarter than, than we can even fathom. You know, and Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the finders cult. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, people thought that that was a front for the CIA. um, That they were tied. I mean, there was evidence that they were tied to the CIA. um, And I mean, you know, I mean, there's like it's so hard because I think that there's just really smart people involved in this that utilize tactics to be able to get away from you know, being discovered mm-hmm. and prosecuted. So to change tactics, if you guys don't mind, from this incredibly dark path we wander down. Um, <laughs> speaking of the hitchhiker effect, so you went out to Chris Bletso, you saw amazing things. You saw burning ones in the sky and yeah. behind you. Uh, have you taken anything from that? Has any of that followed you home? So the next day that I came back from Chris's house, uh, I-, I was me and my boyfriend were really excited to go night watching the night, the, the mm-hmm. night after. Cause we're like, well, apparently we can see these afterwards. So let's see if we can see them by ourselves. So then mm-hmm. at night we went out and we're laying out there and I'm voice messaging Chris and I'm like, you know, maybe we can see the same ones in the sky. And sure enough, you know, we saw five of them and we were voice messaging back with Chris. He was seeing the exact same ones. Um, I have not really gone out and done it much after that. But what I will Mm -hmm. tell you is that after having a conversation with his son, Ryan, and then also asking a lot of questions to Chris, there are so many questions now that I have around Mm -hmm. that story. Because again, I believe they genuinely believe in their story. Mm -hmm. They genuinely, I mean, things are genuinely happening Mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. And they believe that it's great and it's real and all that kind of stuff. But also I have, I'm coming from a standpoint where I don't trust NASA. I don't trust the CIA. I don't trust a lot of things. And these people are very heavily involved with Chris Mm -hmm. and where Chris is located is a hot spot of like crazy things. You have the Fort Bragg military base there you know i saw so many masonic centers when i was there um and it it has a very rich history Mm -hmm. and and chris grew up in that area and it's it it makes me wonder if i mean i hate to put this out there because i i love chris and i love the his story and i fully believe in his story but I sometimes wonder if he is being used as he's being used in a way to to add to this disclosure process. Almost in a Richard Doty Benowitz type scenario. Yes. Yeah. And doesn't yeah. even know it, if that makes That's sense. That's like David Grush at, at the moment. I mean, I don't know if you're up to yes. scratch with David Grush, but it's I I I look at the guy and I don't think he's, I think he believes what he's saying. Uh, I, whoever's giving him this information is another mm-hmm. thing. But I, I do think that, that there is certain players in this, in this field that are being played and they're like, they like, look at Corbell, look, look at, look at his fame, like from, come from no, I mean, he did a good documentary, Bob Lazar, but it's now he's the guy. He's yeah. the guy that they seem to pick and give him all the exclusive piece of footage yeah. that they want to get out to the public. Mm-hmm. Well, you you got to remember that they're experts in, uh, like they do personality tests with military people going in. They're experts at uh, body language. They can, you know, I watched a video on the body language that this guy was reviewing at the, the David Grush video. And mm-hmm. this guy knew David Grush before he even knew anything about David Grush just by his body language. They have people like that in the military. So you can only imagine that they know strategically 
who they would put in certain areas, feed them certain certain information, and they'll run with it. They already know the outcome. So it's like David Grush going in there. It's very interesting that all of a sudden you had random people coming to him and just kind of disclosing some information. And then David Grush, you know, feeling like he was a patriot and, you know, wanted this information out there, came forth and became a whistleblower. You know, maybe all that happened exactly, you know, there's there's nothing behind it. But if you look on the other side, it might have been strategically done. He might have been strategically placed in the UAP task force, fed certain information, knowing by off of his personality test, off of who he is as a person, no knew that by giving him this information, he was going to go and, you know, off and, and do these types of things, you know. And mm -hmm. so that could have been done in a way where he didn't even know that he was a part of a certain operation, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I think the big thing with Grush goes and the um, the hearings that I, my, well, my big takeaway from it is whistleblowers haven't got a great history. They haven't got a great history of good things happening to them. I can't remember Edward Snowden's time in, in the in the U.S. Congress. In fact, I remember him hightailing it to the, to, to Russia. So. Um, it it seems weird that he would be allowed to come forward with such, like I mean, it's if if, if true world changing information, you know, it's it, well, it, Biden it's did well right before that. Biden actually signed into, I think he did an executive order or something like protecting whistleblowers. whistleblowers. Yeah. Yeah, so it was just kind of so. interesting that all of a sudden he puts in that protection order and then all of a sudden, you know, and you it, it could have just been perfectly, mm -hmm. you know, people might have felt more protective, protected after that. Um, but, you know, with all this disclosure, and I talked to Chris about the disclosure. I'm like, what, what do you think about all of this? Because they have a very different narrative. And he goes, they don't know what's going on. They have no idea what this phenomenon is. They they have been interacting with it. They've been trying to interact with it. It doesn't talk to them. It doesn't, uh, it, like, they have been trying, uh, but they have no idea what it is. And so they're trying to control the narrative to not seem like they don't know what it is. Um, and they don't want people waking up and interacting with it because he predicted that, you know, the year 2026, mm -hmm. this woman is going to be presenting herself at a broadcast scale and the government's not going to be able to control that. He's I mean, this is going to be like everyone's mm -hmm. going to know about it mm -hmm. and it will be like the Great Awakening um, and the government. I hope he's not Anjali. What? You, I hope it's not Anjali, Anjali, Anjali. You know the uh, the lady that uh, was in front of um, where was she? She um, went to a cave. I believe it was in Arizona, allegedly a cave with a contractor and his girlfriend at some kind of party get together afterwards thing where they were doing uh, liquid THC and mushrooms and a few other things. And she had an experience that was an abduction by aliens and that they lived in the mountain. And then she had a press conference and it wasn't from we, the psychedelics. <laughs> I mean, I've seen I, I, aliens I, I don't on think, psychedelics. I don't, I don't, I don't think <laughs> I have. any of it actually happened to her. Uh, I, I'll hold my, but anyway, that's, that's who she is. She's, she's an interesting person who's obviously been trained in um, how to control a conversation, uh, how to counter a conversation she has had formal training in it uh, of some kind. Yeah, uh, not very good training, but definitely enough to to walk around any of the, the UFO. We had her on. Yeah, I know we did. Yeah. Oh, nice. um, we we yeah, were talking not, about it, and she just yeah. turned up. She just it, she messaged and said Amazing she wanted to come how on that the works. show. It was Whoa. almost like the algorithm was being watched. Uh, yeah, she's not as good as like Lou Elizondo, who is phenomenal at controlling the conversation. He's he's good, um, but she's not bad. And she has a show now on Gaia, and she pushes a narrative, and she has a following. And it just yeah. kind of popped up. I mean, she had that in a couple weeks, cinched up. It was amazing. That's that's interesting. 
Yeah, yeah I've, I been said, trying to, uh, I've been trying to sell us to the CIA forever, man. They're just not buying. I'm very disappointed. <laughs> very disappointed in this. Uh, I'm interested in your uh, seeing aliens on uh, psychedelics, Avery, because oh. uh, like all, all of all of us have had some reasonably interesting. Uh, I have no idea what they're talking about. Alex. I took a heroic dose one time. Mm-hmm. How much and, was that? Oh, I, I honestly, I don't even remember because these okay. were super potent. So even if mm-hmm. I told you like the amount, it was like I only had to take mm-hmm. like a mushroom. Yeah. Not like an eight that some people take or whatever. Mm-hmm. It was like these were just so potent. And I took it and I went to the Anunnaki. Okay. They mm-hmm. they said that they were the Anunnaki and that I was their leader and that I gone into a boardroom and we we're sitting around a, a table and there was like a very sophisticated like conversation about like me being their leader and I am part Anunnaki and all this other stuff. And I was like, it's, I mean, that was very interesting for me, but I've never done anything like that again. Just Maybe the you, it's you that, that's going to do it in 2026. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. I mean, that's maybe like, this is the beginning. Cause I went and saw Chris Bledsoe, you know, got acquainted with the phenomenon and <laughs> I, <laughs> I got to be interested. I am very so. I've actually messaged Blood, so I haven't heard back yet. I'm because I only live a couple hours from him as well. Oh, I live you do. In East, I live in East Tennessee. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So we're not very the, far I live from on, each other. No, I live on the other side of the mountains okay. than he does, uh, and I also live near a government facility. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I desperate. I, I don't say I'm desperately, but I am extremely interested. And trying to go out there and watch one evening because I have my own theories and hypotheses that I'll, I'll leave off for this. But um, yeah, I'm very, very curious. I have, yeah, I'm curious. You can take your own equipment. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I told him basically, this is what I, this is what I did. I just emailed or just messaged him and said, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to be coming up there. Where's the best place to find orbs? <laughs> and he's like because in my mind i was thinking like i'm gonna find out where this guy lives and i'm just gonna camp out on his yard and see if i can see some orbs if these things come every night i'm gonna be able to see them yeah and so i was like yeah. so where's the best place to find orbs and he's like he he's like you're looking for a good mexican <laughs> Yeah, but then I started talking about like just my own personal story, and then I go, mm-hmm. maybe you would want to like share the night sky when I'm up there. I don't know, like maybe. And he's like, yeah, I think I could do that. And I was like, no way. <laughs> uh, but he's he's like, man, I get I get t- like 20 people a day messaging me to come and visit me. I think he, Post mm-hmm. Malone is gonna be coming to see him soon oh, to experience it. But it. he's like, uh, he goes. I get so many people, but I usually go with my intuition. And he goes, mm-hmm. and something told me to to bring you here. Well, and I'm I was like, not getting in. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Um, and so that was a uh, yeah, it was definitely an experience. And then maybe you try and reach out to Ryan Bledsoe because um, Ryan has a podcast, Bledsoe said so, mm-hmm. and. Um, He's a lot more talkative than his his dad, and he's always like up for meeting people. And you know, since we we talked and stuff, I'm going up there. Um, yeah. you know, talk to him about you guys too. I appreciate. I want to compare the lights because where I live, you can look at the night sky any night, and you will see lights in the sky. <coughs> Don't like know what, what they kind are. of lights? Lights. They're just lights. They like, move around. It... They flash. They do their own thing. They'll stop. And then they'll take off again. It's very okay. Strange. Well, then you already you already know the phenomenon. Then I do know the phenomenon, <laughs> but I want to compare phenomena. Oh, you want to make sure it's the, like the same thing. Well, I live next to a government installation. It could be anything. <laughs> like, yeah, that's, that's the thing. I like. It's, it's like I don't know they where, but it's. I mean, you know, anyone who knows history could figure out the proximity to what I live near. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> um, but yeah, it. So I'm, I'm very curious. I'm curious for my own my own experiences in life, and and I I'm, I'm curious. 
I yeah. witnessed this as well. Lee, unfortunately, was having a paranormal come down, uh, but mm-hmm. I was with Dave looking Lee, up, and it was incredible. He was finishing up talking to God. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, th- and that was weird yeah. because, like, literally, we'd done the haunted uh, the j- the jail, and like, all of a sudden, Lee just you just came down feeling all weird, mm-hmm. didn't you? And you just. You couldn't was that out. was that when you didn't go out? I thought it was the uh no, he, that was out. when he couldn't he couldn't um oh, you know. yeah, yeah 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 okay okay yeah, yeah I'm very I'm very curious by the the Chris Bledsoe thing I'm super curious by it um your interview you, with him was fantastic you did a good job thank you uh, yeah. you know there, there's some things too that you know just even talking to Ryan Bledsoe and and trying to get his understanding of like what he believes this is he he truly believes that like um nobody under like no religion nobody has really grasped the Mm -hmm. concept of what this is like he believes in jesus he believes in all that kind of stuff but he's like this is something that people it's almost a combination of everybody's like explaining the exact same thing but just Mm -hmm. putting their own viewpoint on it and i can I can kind of get behind that because I've had those revelations before in my mind where uh, science is talking about the same thing that the Bible is talking about. And it's almost like everything is explaining the other, but we're just putting different terms on it and, Mm -hmm. and we're only getting fragments of it. And we're making our whole story Mm -hmm. of these little fragments and it oftentimes overlaps with everybody else's. And so it's a, it's really interesting. And there was another thing that kind of got into my mind too, was like, you know, the Christianity is only like 2000 years old. Judaism Mm -hmm. is like 3,500 years old or something like that, or longer there. There's all these religions that have popped up, but Egypt in the pyramids is like, goes way, way back. And they had their own religion. And someone goes, well, who told them what their religious beliefs were back then? Like who, who saved them back then? Mm. You know, it, it was kind of like, has to come from somewhere. There has to be a source. Yeah. And it's almost like we have been playing telephone almost and, and constructing these things and making these narratives and these stories around exactly the same thing, mm-hmm. you know, and we're just putting different labels on it. And us being humans, we always want to be right. Mm-hmm. And so we're like, if you're wrong, <laughs> you're going to hell. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think things exactly what we're doing now with um with aliens and UFOs is what we're calling this thing that's been around for thousands of years, what we can think of. Because I've said said before on this show, I wonder if you know you you, you have the uh, like biblical chariots of fire. Um the I've the I I don't know exactly how true this is and i'm probably butchering it but when the um when the americas were discovered when the the gall- galleons rolled in and they sent like uh, ships or boats onto the onto the shore the natives that met the people that came off the boats couldn't see the galleons until they were shown them and, and had them explained to them because it was so out of the realms of their reality that they just simply couldn't see them. They couldn't perceive them. So I always wonder whether like the chariots of fire and stuff like that, whether that was wh- when they saw these things in the sky, were they seeing like literal chariots of fire? Like that's what they saw. They saw chariots with horses on fire in the sky because their brains filled the gaps in. So now we live in a technolo- te- technological uh, society. We see essentially see like, flying iPods and flying cars in the sky because that's the closest thing we can. Yeah. It's the closest thing we can make a thing. You know, what's interesting. I think about the phenomenon is I was at a building and it was like a a walkthrough kind of a haunting tour. And I think the haunting phenomenon, so I'm not really a ghost believer, but I believe some aspect of that phenomenon, like it's all very strange. The whole thing's encompassing. So I just kind of lump it all together. It's just me. But we were encountering something very interesting. It was one of those proximity lights that go off. Everyone's standing away. It's flashing in response to questions. It's on kind of a half-assed video out of the corner because of the way it was mounted. You couldn't see it well. 
And uh, one of the guys that was there, who is not a believer, who is a skeptic, just sees it happening. You can see it. He turns around and walks down the hall. And then after everyone goes up to this one particular guy, like, see, we told you there's something to it. And he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm like, wait a minute. What? You were just there. He's like, no, no, I didn't see anything. You guys are having a mass hallucination. That never happened. That's interesting. He could not process it psychologically. That was, yes. that was my takeaway. He was like, he's going to deny, deny. He cannot accept this reality. He cannot do that. <laughs> well, Until that's it, kind of like what Chris was saying is that once you see it and you experience it and believe it, it you now have the ability to see it. It's like, mm-hmm. it's almost like what, what even quantum physics is talking about. In order to tap into these higher frequencies, you have to elevate your frequency in order to be able to experience these frequencies. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of this this spectrum of what, you know, science and this holographic universe has been talking about is like these higher frequencies can look down into our dimension, but we can't look up into theirs because of the difference in these frequencies. And once you once you can create that frequency you have access to these frequencies so i don't know if like you know when it talks about how we live in a fractal universe and how Mm -hmm. all these things are actually happening all around us it's just kind of bleeding into our reality uh it's like is this stuff happening more because more people are seeing it and experiencing it. And so mm-hmm. we're now, uh, we've kind of opened that veil. Mm-hmm. And every time someone sees it, it's like, you know, it's really interesting because it, it, when you really look into holographic universe theory, fractal universe, simulation theory, which all kind of stems off of each other, mm-hmm. you see that like even just down to the, to our DNA and, the software programs and all these different things are all running on the same codes. And it's almost like Mm -hmm. we live in a, in a like software program Mm -hmm. and that someone created the software program. And in that case, it's like our brain is, is like the computer and we can like, it's just, it's the programming all the time, you know, and we can create that program. And it's just like, I don't know. It, there's so much to it. It would make sense for what we do because, like, what, what one of the big things that we've tried to do, you know, ever since people start trying to speak to each other, communicate with each other, mm-hmm. is ways of relaying information to each other. So you can break down human achievements to how simply we've been able to make communication. You know, even to, like realistically, what we're doing now breaks uh, that, like fundamental nature of what humans should be able to do there is no way us four should be able to have a conversation right now like this and then there is no way us four in different parts of different parts of the world should be able to then broadcast it to people yeah so the like from the beginning of when humans existed that never would have been a possibility yeah so how does that if if we are if, if we have some sort of like tactical impact on our reality by just by by thought you know by observing it then what what does that do you know what does that instant communication with uh with so many people do at any one time and I, i've often wondered whether the Pandora's like, box kind, kind of but it's i i wonder whether what we do what we have as far as um entertainment helps like shape reality because we've if if you look we've just gone through this massive phase of um like superheroes being like the main entertainment property in the world mm-hmm. and what what's happened to is we've if if you think that we we create the reality around us all we've done for the past decade is create heroes and villains you know, we've for every Rogan, you've got a Biden or a Klaus Schwab or an um, the an Elon Musk. You know, we keep like creating these like heroes and villains, like it's some sort of fucking superhero movie. So I I just wonder whether that's 
the that's the result of social media and the result of instant communication with people. One hundred percent. I I really truly believe that media, social media, all of it is just it's it's a mass program on our mm -hmm. computer system that we mm -hmm. have in our brain, and so every single type of information we take in goes in it gets processed in our mind and when we sleep it gets processed and then programmed into our subconscious and our subconscious we don't we can't go like we operate off of our subconscious so consciously mm -hmm. it's like 10 percent of our brain is like or even our awareness is our conscious awareness and 90 percent is our subconscious that is running all the operations Mm -hmm. And it's running off of all the information that we have taken in. And then it operates off of that. And we think that like, I mean, it's really about what you take in, you know, that really creates your reality. Mm -hmm. um, and so obviously us being in the conspiracy world, like we see them everywhere. We see conspiracies everywhere. We see all that kind of stuff. And then you have other people who don't, see that kind of stuff i think that there's this illusion of what's real and then there's the perception because there's no reality there's only perception mm -hmm. and we're all living in our own little worlds that are completely different than everybody else's and we're all trying to like we're only getting fragments of everybody else's world but there is a real world going on we're just all perceiving it differently and we all oh, have yeah, the this option the like, simplest way, the simplest way for that is, is, is that I, there is no way that I could ever know what color blue is to your eyes. Yeah, they, they, that's they, that's the simplest way to look at it. You know, we, we all kind of know what blue is. We've we've got a vague idea, but like I, I like I I struggle with like long distance, for instance, or mm -hmm. uh, maybe this eye is slightly stronger, stronger than that eye. So the color will always be different to what, what you see. So we're always perceiving reality around us differently, even like on a micro scale like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, uh, I found that video to share of the things. If you guys, it, it'll be a fun talking point, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. Don't play it for two seconds, Dave, because I was just going to drop myself down. Are you going to play it? Yeah. Bastard. Oh, this is the AI. <laughs> Can you see it? Yeah. Good. Oh. All right. Cool. That is the AI generated. So that's the AI generation uh, or generating what? An alien? Some, or... Somebody put the. No, no. That is biblical. It's biblically accurate angels. They took the descriptions from the Bible wheels within wheels covered in eyes with a burning center with an eye at the center, right? Like, so when. Uh, you know, Elijah sees a flight over or Samuel or whatever that or Ezekiel, especially like the wheels mm. were Ezekiel's. Mm -hmm. This is what the AI interpreted. So I'm going to take that literal interpretation. You know, it's got, you know, eight wings, wings for feet, wings for heads, covered in eyes around a center eyed while it's burning. Right. So there's Ezekiel. Yeah. There's, you know, Ezekiel's wheel and chariot. And then this would be like what a seraphim would look like or, you know, or, or in Revelations, you see the one beast with four heads. Mm -hmm. Wings covering all sides. This is uh, what AI said. There's Ezekiel's will. Hmm. It's, it's a crazy thing there because they. I watched um, a film that I'd, I'd been told was terrible. Um, nope, the other day, and um, it's not it, terrible. It's just not genius, and everyone expected genius from him. Yeah. Oh yeah. But what, but what yeah. I it was really like, hyped, and it was I didn't like it. It was just no. okay. I didn't yeah. like the, I didn't like the film, but what one thing I did like is what they did with the the UFO. What was he doing? Oh, I have happening. no idea. Um, is that this thing was it was alive and it kind of turned into it, it. That that you've just shown, Dave, reminded me of what it did. It went up into like an angel wet and all oh, unraveled yeah, with the itself. Creature and folded itself. Yeah, I I do think like with UFOs. The paranormal, everything that's going on in the world right now. I did. I when I first met you, Dave, that you you kind of put me onto this. I have uh, no idea what you're talking about, Ollie. I no, <laughs> I know, mate. It's it's all linked. But like you mentioned, was it Chris? You said that had the experience with the white lady. Mm -hmm. So I've had experience with the white lady that I can't remember. That sounds really bad. 
um, m- when I was a child, my mum said that I used to go into the bedroom and say that I'd seen a white lady in my room. And my mum used to say, like, what, what's, what, what does she do? And I just say, she just smiles. Apparently, I was about six years old. And I used to do this over and over again. And then one night, my mother woke up and she saw a white lady at the end edge of the bed. And the next morning, she had a miscarriage. Oh, my gosh. So I can't remember seeing well, this white, white lady at all. But The interesting part cool. that you say about that is Chris said that the majority of people, all the people who come to him that have these experiences, like the orbs and and seeing entities and all that stuff, all 100% of them stemmed it down to either a death in the family, some sort of traumatic experience. Um, it, it usually revolves around something like traumatic um, when these things come. And which is also another interesting thing, you know, uh, mm. to think about. It's like when we're when we're energetically in a really bad space or something bad's going to happen, then this experience comes in, you know. Mm. Um, she had a lot. Of, she had a lot of miscarriage as well. She she's my mum's uh, rhesus negative, so it rejects the. Uh, I don't know how it works, the science behind it, but apparently yeah, it's like your body eats it. Yeah, instead. her immune yeah, system rejects, rejects it. it as a she calls body. me the miracle yeah. child. And my dad calls me something else. <laughs> Every so do we. Well, so do we. Yeah. Every time I speak to well, yeah, I think she had one too few. I did I did wanna I did want to ask because no. I we normally I, I normally like to ask a guest this question, especially if, if we have mentioned UFOs and aliens. So so our logo, it's it's the classic kind of alien, more sin. We have more of a sinister alien gray look kind of thing. Um, we spoke about Cry- Crowley before we went live on the show, and he has the like the was it is it morph lamb the, lamb sorry lamb. Um, do you think there's anything to the actual alien gray? Have you heard? cases with your research that you think well actually there might be something to this um i think that there's a lot of narratives out there about it there's a potential that these have been created by our own government um and that they're operating off of some sort of artificial intelligence and um and this is to this is all created in order to change the narrative about this phenomenon so that we think it's it's you know aliens that are going to attack our planet and get behind the government and all that kind of stuff um there's that theory and then there's also the you know just based off of what i've heard even with just like these alien abductions people see different things these things can manifest themselves any way that they want um they can present themselves in any familiar way. And I think that sometimes they manifest themselves off of what the person perceives, if that makes sense. Like if the person is thinks of an alien as a gray alien, that's how it presents itself. Mm-hmm. Um, I someone thinks of a giant prey mantis. That's how it presents similar, that, itself. That's a similar thing to what I was thinking about how people perceive the UFOs. Yeah. Yeah, it's like why does it have to be a disc? If 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 they've been around for so long, why can't they upgrade their technology? You know what I mean? It's yeah. like Yeah. You think look at cars, we have a new car coming out like every single year. You know, these things need to be looking different, but apparently they've just been a disc, a tic-tac and a, a or like a sphere and you know, there's some random ones coming around, but when you think about just that got to a point, they got to a point where we've, we've cracked it, lads. This, <laughs> it's like, this is, is a spaceship. Is- and that's as far as it goes <laughs> <laughs> but i think that if we're putting it in terms of like these things are higher intelligent which is why david grush said i'm not referring to them as extraterrestrial i'm referring to them as non-human intelligence because we can't think of them as coming from a galaxy or another planet or even just in our own dimension 
Uh, mm -hmm. This is a higher intelligence that has the capability of doing things that we can't even understand. So in that sense, it's like, then maybe they're just presenting themselves in a way that we have created, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and as we are creating more, you're getting more like differences. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So I don't, I don't think, know. I don't think anybody's ever asked David Grush in all the, the he's, not, he's not mean in many interviews, but nobody's actually said to her, um, what do you, did you ask what they look like? You know, because he, he says he can't say much about it. Well, well they shied actually, away from the whole bodies thing. Yeah, they shied, they shied away from bodies for, for a while. Yeah, there, there, was, there was a while where we would just, there, there was people talk about like retrieved wreckage, but nobody would ask the questions of like, well, was there anything in it? You know, it's, and it, 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 it kind of, that changed with Grush, wasn't it? The non-human biologics came with him. Well, he did. He said it very, very strategically. He mm -hmm. said there's dead pilots that came with the crash, which makes us all think there's a body there. Right. But he mm -hmm. never said there's a body. He said there's a dead pilot. And then he said they're not extraterrestrial. He calls them non-human intelligence. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, this is what I'm going to say, because I asked Chris Bledsoe about this. I said, how are they getting if these are spirits and these are angels how are they getting biologic proof of this stuff right how do we have a flying saucer that's crashed how do we have dead pilots and he said these things have been gifted to us from other galaxies okay like the in this this really blew my mind um when he he showed me an image of uh, he had in his phone he had a piece of metal that came from like five million galaxies away or something like that that had come off of something that had crashed into earth and mm -hmm. it was metal and what they found was that there was actual human dna that was ingrained inside of this metal and at the time science was trying to figure out how to implant like metal into human bodies and have the human body attached to the metal because um, at that time we just didn't, we didn't have the science to understand it. Mm -hmm. And so allegedly now, and I've worked in dentistry for a really long time. Now I know like when we implant titanium, you know, implants or screws or any of that kind of stuff, the bone actually grows to the metal and that actually that scientific breakthrough came from this piece of metal that had crashed here on earth hmm. and it gave researchers and science an understanding of how to connect dna with the metal in order for it to attach and so he said that you know these things that are coming and crashing are coming from other places and they're done as gifts to help humankind and so when he says we have biologics and dead pilots, I'm thinking in my own mind, what if we don't have bodies? What if we just have this non-human intelligence that is operating these things that are crashing here on Earth and we're perceiving it as a body, but mm. in reality, it's not a body. It's a an intelligence that we don't understand. It's interesting that you say that because it, it makes something ring in my head from his book when he went to NASA and the Tim Taylor character, which makes me kind of think of Travis Taylor, but uh, especially his description of him, um, told him to sing a song in his head as he goes past the black boxes on the NASA. Did you not remember that from the book? I can't remember. So when he goes down to NASA and he's going around, he's told that when he goes past the black boxes at the security checkpoint and, and the Taylor gentleman had told him before that when these things show up and you feel overwhelmed or you feel negative or you feel scared, you need a four minute song to sing in your head. You sing the song for four minutes and it doesn't allow influence or emotional control. Oh, and yes. then, yeah, so then he could go, and he said, when you go to NASA, you're going to go by security, sing that song in your head. You'll see the black boxes. 
sing that song for four minutes till you get out of sight of them, which I thought was interesting. But, yeah. So yeah. that makes me think that this is, this is something that's not, that doesn't have a, a, a biological body that we're thinking mm-hmm. of that. Cause if you listen to his words, he never says we have like bodies, you know, like, mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, granted the Congress person was like, did bodies come with, these things and he's he's like as i stated in my news nation interview um biologics came he he's very very specific on how he says things Mm -hmm. yes and so it almost plays into the narrative that there's aliens Mm. but i don't really i can't necessarily and like when you think of the mexico when they brought those those little alien bodies i Mm. think this is all very strategically set because I don't I don't trust those alien bodies from well, Mexico. But I was saying to to Ollie the other day the when you look at what the the things that are being promoted, it's none of it's kind of new. You know the the bodies weren't new. Um, the Bob Lazar wasn't new. Um, we've been t- it's sort of teased. In the the first Grush interview with the um, Australian guy, I can't remember his name. The interviewer, uh, when he brought up Roswell, Ross Cohart, yeah, yeah, the we brought up Roswell. Roswell, he said, "Oh, uh, well, that's still classified. I can't talk about that." I think that they've strategically used people like Lazar or um, the Mexican guy with the with the aliens. I mean, the, with the bodies, yeah, Sam. I think they've strategically used people that are corruptible, and that they can string this along with. I, I, I think we will get something next year when this release comes. And this is, I've, I've nothing to go off this. It's just pure like gut hunch. Uh, we're going to get something like, that. like cast iron. I'm pretty good with it as well, aren't I, Ollie? Pretty yeah. good with it. Um. Mm. The uh, we're going to get some cast iron next year, revolving around Roswell. Like I, I genuinely think we will get as far as they want us to believe. I think we'll get pictures of bodies and crash wreckage. I'm, I'm co- almost convinced by it that this is they're going to build up to it, and then they're going to fall back on because we've been fed these things for so long, and Roswell was like the apex of it all. You know, it's the I mean, think about the hundreds of documentaries that there must be about Ros- uh, about Roswell, um, like cult TV shows. You know, the uh, sci-fi, like kids' TV, teens' TV show. Um, it, it's perfect. It's perfect if you want to use something for some sort of soft disclosure in the way you want. Roswell's perfect for it. Well, but that's I, because it's the case that, and we've said this loads of times on it that mum and dad will rem- will, will know you know mm-hmm. yeah it's the, it's the mm-hmm. case that people that are not into the subject will, will if, all know yeah if they're, tr- if they're trying to frame a narrative before 2026 and blood says right um that would be a good one to use because they could say this is the beginning narrative here's grush you're allowed to clear oh this immediately backs up that look these two points connect it must be now you know that way when something does happen, everyone's like, oh, I mean, I don't know. Well, don't he know. believes that they know that disclosure is coming because they know that uh, apparently they already know that these things are going to come out of the government's control and they know when it's going to be. And that's the time frame that Chris was talking about in 2026. Mm-hmm. And he believes that right now they're trying to shape the narrative for this this thing that comes to basically convolute what happened. So, you know, if they think we have alien bodies and, you know, Stephen Greer is talking about how he witnessed alien bodies with that are mechanical and that have been created by the government. And then you have David Grush coming out and saying stuff. And then, you know, I think they might be trying to create a narrative that's falsified Mm -hmm. So that they get, so everybody gets behind the government and not these things when they come. Mm-hmm. Um, in order to keep that control, 
because he, you know, it, it could be something to like, I feel like we're a slave race, right? We we're literally a slave race. It feels and like there's panic probably. going on as well. It feels like there's panic going on when you look at the restrictions in speech. You look at the 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 way that people are go, going after government like, trying to like, take pla- control platforms. You know, it's uh, the I, I I don't know what you think about the whole um, uh, Russell Brand thing that's going on right now, but. It does seem really weird that this all bubbles up to the surface when he's talking about a big farmer and big government and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it feels like they, they definitely want like a control system, like a heavy control system put in, and they're trying to do it as quickly as possible. Um, the only other thing I, I thought was the like the idea of Project Blue Beam scenario, where if you look at everything from um, the we we did an episode of uh, on nine eleven not so long ago, and uh, the like the idea of like the no no plane thing popped up a lot with the nine eleven episode, oh. and if you if you look at that you look at um, the the way media has like pushed us into having having these belief systems and stuff, and then even into like COVID. I wonder whether we've seen small. Because, sorry, I was I meant meant, meant to say the Maui uh, the uh, wildfires as well. You know, where you you see supposed like directed energy weapons and stuff like that. Have we already seen every single element of what it would need to be to create Project Blue Beam? If you say, if if we go with the idea of like the planes weren't real, so we've seen the holograms, uh, directed energy weapons, or we've see, seen the weapons. The um, uh, COVID, like whatever the fuck that two years was, was a a, me- a media test of mm. how compliant people are. Um, All this stuff is happening yeah. perfectly at this time mm-hmm. to yeah. to see how much control they can get over the entire population. Because if you look back in time. You know, when money was created and then the banks were created and this slow process has happened to the point of we now and we don't even realize that we think we have control over our lives because we get to pick our jobs and we get to to go to school and like pick what we want to do. And, you know, we think we live in a free world and Mm -hmm. we have we don't because, you know, for example, don't pay your taxes. Mm-hmm. Don't pay your taxes and see what happens. You do not live in a free world unless you want to go. Sometimes I think about it going to one of those villages that nobody has technology or anything. They don't, they just live off grid, live in their community. I'm like, that kind of sounds nice. Um, but we are so dependent on everything. And when the government wants a little bit more surveillance on us, a little bit more control, they will create something onto the population to get more of that. So it's just like 9-11. What happened after 9-11? I mean, the Thank amount you. of, yeah, the amount of surveillance now that was needed because they they create these things where it's like they create something really bad. So the public goes, that's really bad. We need more help to prevent that. And in order to do that, we need to take so much more rights away from you. Mm -hmm. We need to now have surveillance here. We now need to check everything that you have in TSA. We need to, to do all these different types of things. And we now need a, a new government agency for this, you know, and all these things have happened. It's just like with COVID COVID was like a a mass test on all the population Mm -hmm. to, to, it's like, a one world government almost right Mm -hmm. because all the governments had to come together and try to implement these things onto their people and it was kind of like a test to see can we get everybody in line it's like covid was an intelligence test and we failed miserably america is the best (laughs) i just gotta say america like does i mean there's a lot of idiots but there's also like I, i feel like for the most part, it's, there's people who just won't back down. They're mm-hmm. like ready to get their guns out and just start blasting. 
It's because like, we're heavily no. armed. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But it's like, you know, it's it's like if America wasn't set up the way that it is, I feel like there would be already this oh, yeah. major control system. And the, there is something there is something very like, special about America, I think. Yeah, the and I, I, I don't think in a country like the UK, for instance, I, I think it would be a lot harsher if America had fallen further to this. Yeah, I do. That's where the guns okay. come in. I'm just I'm not harping on it. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to tell a man what to do who's armed. That's true. <laughs> you know? That's yeah, true. Suddenly, suddenly everybody's on equal cue, footing here, especially when he has friends and then they are armed. <laughs> you pretty much have created your own mini military. I have. You're like, yeah. come at me, bro. <laughs> Avery, you've kindly given us like almost two and a half hours of your time now. So like, we know you're on Rockfin. I know you're on uh, you're on Spotify. You also have a YouTube channel as well. Yes, YouTube I, is. I, I'm just starting YouTube. Right. I, I don't like video. Ugh. It's been causing me a headache. So, YouTube, not as many videos. I'm I'm starting to get them out there. So mm -hmm. if you're on my YouTube channel, um, but yeah, I'm on Rockfin YouTube. I'm on all major podcast platforms. So go subscribe, people. Yes. Go subscribe. Um, you'll have to come, you'll have to come on again on, on a YouTube one as next time. We 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 can't be as as free as we are in Rockville, unfortunately, but um <laughs> we, we can still have fun. Really? You can't? No, you you cannot have fun on there. He's he's lying. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to the day that Lee and I get to take that channel down and we get to see how far we go into the conversation before <laughs> YouTube just pulls that fucking book. <laughs> yeah, every, every single monitor. I mean, we've, we've, we're have we heading towards like, I think we've got 11,000 subscribers on there now. Mm -hmm. And it's it's like every video goes yellow for monetization, every single one, without without a doubt. And then I have to we have to apply and then they turn the monetization on about five days earlier, uh, five days later. That's unless crazy. we have certain guests. Mm -hmm. yeah, certain, guests certain guests will immediately get the green pass. I my, my favorite one is... is a, um, I mean, <laughs> it's I mean you know. We're, we're only like a medium, a medium sized thing. But or the, tiny. I, I've had 1,400 followers now on Twitter for two years. Like the, the, it'll go 1,405, then I'll lose six, and then it'll slowly climb its way back up, and it'll it'll drop back down again. Uh, it's it's just hilarious how difficult it is to try and get alternative com uh, content out. I think. Oh, I know. I mean, I have uh, already going into this field. I had already a very large platform. I think collectively, I had around three hundred thousand. Uh, wow. people following mm -hmm. me and mm -hmm. I thought when I started my podcast I was going to easily just mm -hmm. convert all those people and it was going to skyrocket but when you're in this field and of talking about things yeah, it's it, those everything is just against you Yeah, everything either. is against you it's crazy Yeah, uh, I like to ask people uh, before before they leave the, uh, the show um, if, if someone put a gun to your head and said I want three conspiracy theories that you believe 100% to be true where are they which ones do i believe to be 100% true 100% true yeah oh Same the memory. the 911 inside job mm -hmm. 100% um oh my gosh there's so many um that I'd not that i believe are 100% true uh but all true <laughs> it might be <laughs> um okay so 9-11 being an inside job and um the uh, i mean the roswell incident i definitely believe that that was covered up um with tim foil yeah i don't i don't know the, the i don't know i'm Terrible when I'm put on the spot. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. 
Let me get back to you on the last one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the other ones are up for debate. So, I don't know. Fair enough. I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to pretend it was adrenochrome. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have information on that, that, like scientific information that kind of like convoluted my mind on that. That like adrenochrome is not n like necessarily possible to the extent that it's being made out to be. I'll have to send you information on that. Yeah, but absolutely. I'm just, I mean, just like with everything, there's a narrative for either side, and it really just depends on where you're getting your baseline information. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like science. And I'll say this before we go, because science, if you go back to science and you recreate the baseline of science, the foundation of science, our science will look completely different than it does today. Mm -hmm. It will look nothing like it did. So that's that's what I'll say about that is like whatever the baseline that you're getting your information from is what's going to create the outcome of what it is. So it's like you can't always trust science, you know. I don't trust they have, I don't they trust have anything coats, or anyone. <laughs> they, have, they have white coats. And like sometimes they have the little name tag there, which has got doctor on it, and they tell right. me things are safe and effective. It's they, it's perfect. And they went to an indoctrination camp for so long. <laughs> so <laughs> they have to know the truth. <laughs> um thanks very much for coming on the podcast, Avery. This has been mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, I hope you'll come back on and speak to us again in the future. Absolutely. Um, yeah. This is fun. Thank you guys. I would love to have you guys on my show too. So I would love to. Yeah, anytime. Did they're like a shot. What? what? <laughs> I, I don't know why we keep him it's around. A, it's a British saying. <laughs> Occasionally he comes in, says something. <laughs> it's his it's his channel. It's, this is his show. I love it. Yeah, we're it the, well, we've all teamed up now. <laughs> we've all teamed up now. It used to be just me solo. Oh, now I'm it. now I'm just the little comedian in the in the corner. No, comedians. Are <laughs> oh, you're now. you're something in the corner. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just, just guy. I wish I guy. I could recruit more people. I'm working on it. I mean, we I can mean, sell him. <laughs> oh yeah, you'll get it. Oh, now you're trying to traffic Do me. A little yeah. trade. Yes, we are trying to traffic you. I'm Molly. too old to traffic. <laughs> No, you look like a young boy. You'll be fine. Probably. Oh, I mean, well, not till you arrive. <laughs> it's going to go all downhill. <laughs> we but, don't you even know. care if you cut them up. You can use them for spare parts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Dang. absolutely. Go subscribe to Chiller Queen, people. Yes. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thank Bye -bye. you so much, guys. Cheers. Cheers. So the abductions usually always happen at night. These people don't really get abducted during the day. Usually a UFO appears and then the abductee blacks out. Okay. They then become paralyzed. A beam comes down and they begin to levitate up into the ship. They can even be transported through like solid objects like walls. And then the aliens will sometimes appear out of thin air. Okay. The abductees are then experimented on with like these primitive surgical tools, which I find very odd if they have such advanced technology. But the entities, when they're captured, they usually tell the abductee that their intentions are really good. Abductees have even mentioned that they say that they created humans, that they are the creator of Earth. Some have even disguised themselves as Jesus. Celebrities, well-known figures, family members, and they do this to gain the trust of the abductee. And in this regard, if what they're saying is true, you have to ask yourself why. Why do they need to conduct themselves in this way?